Today I want you to uh, turn with me to Exodus, the book of Exodus. And uh, I'm turning there. Uh, what I want to talk about is just the way that God operates in our lives, regardless of the circumstances. And in Exodus, we know that it's, it is what it says, Exodus. They're leaving. The children of Israel are supposed to come out of bondage. And uh, when we get saved, we're supposed to come out of bondage, right? Yeah. Don't you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, we do have some stairs to climb. Everybody does. And climbing those stairs, what it does is it takes you to a new level each time you climb a new stair. It doesn't mean that you uh, literally change maybe in your language or change in your, your whole attitude and total life. But what it does mean is that there is a change that's gradual. Now when we look at the book of Exodus, what this talks about are the children of Israel, and it talks about how they come out and uh, they're in bondage simply due to favor. Isn't that funny? Here you are a child of God, you get saved, you give your life to the Lord. Okay, here you're serving God. And initially, this is my theory, the first nine months to a year, year and a half probably sometimes. But the first nine months of your life in salvation are nine months of great blessing. God begins to move. He begins to set free. He begins to deliver. You see new things. You see the ways change in your own life. All of this. So the children of Israel, here they come to Egypt. They go there simply because Joseph, he is captured and he go, goes into bondage because his brothers sold him. Now that's a fun story. How many of you would like to have your family look at you and say, you know what, we can make more money off than you're going to cost us. So we're going to sell you. Well, this uh, is kind of what happened to Joseph. His brothers didn't like him. He was the favorite kid, and they had an opportunity to get rid of him. They did. Sold him to some slave traders. Slave traders took him to Egypt, went into Egypt. He got there. They sold him. He went to a man named Potiphar, goes into the house, and becomes a, a favored a slave of his house goes in, he gets favor, and before you know it, he's doing really super well. The guy gives him control of everything, and uh, then he finds out that his, his wife, Potiphar's wife, she falls in love with Joseph. She really likes him, wants him. Uh, kind of the way uh, sometimes we can get trapped. But in that, he goes ahead and she wants him, he doesn't want her, because he honors the, uh, the man of the house. She tells a lie, says that he tried to rape her, they put him in prison. He comes finally out of prison through some strange happenings, he gets free, he ends up becoming this right hand man to Pharaoh. He has control of the entire nation of Egypt, Joseph. And his father and his brothers are still living away from him in Israel. They come during a famine because they have no food. And then before you know it, everything turns. Joseph brings them in. They have favor. Joseph ends up dying. But there's all of these Jewish people who end up in a place called Goshen. They begin to accumulate, they, they have kids, they have more and more people, and they're overwhelming the country of Egypt. So here's the scene. So now, I want to read to you what exactly happens with this whole scene that I've just explained to you. 
Exodus chapter 1, I'm going to start with uh, uh, verse 7, or 6. It says this, in 5 it says, All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was in G Egypt already. And Joseph died, all his brothers in that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied, grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now look what it says. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and it happen in the event of, the, of war that they might also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted him, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in the dread of the children of Israel. So here they're like roaches. They start, you, you get rid of them, more come, more eggs grow. Before you know it, the house is full of them. Well, here it says, verse 13, so the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. They made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. And their service in which they made, made them serve was with rigor. Okay, so here they are, they're slaves, and they put them under this great bondage. So with them, they ended up getting trapped, they're crying to God, they're saying, God, we're, we're being unfairly treated, set us free, God hears their cry. And as we look at what happens to men who prosper, they become enemies to many people. Agreed? Yeah. Let's look at uh, uh, football. When you look at the New England Patriots, <laughs> I'm not a fan, and they now have been in more Super Bowls than anybody, and they've won as many Super Bowls as the Pittsburgh Steelers. People hate the Patriots. Their quarterback, Tom Brady, he's this uncommon machine. We hate him because he's so awesome. People begin to hate people that prosper. Agreed? Not, not always, but they envy them, they get mad at them, they don't like the idea that they're prosperous, so they do things to try and, and trip them up, or there's negative words that go against them. Well, the Patriots are like that. Everybody's like, eh, who cares? Well, they're a great team. They have great players and they play great games, and they're good. So we go on with that, and we see now that we would hate for them to win another Super Bowl, because we want to win another Super Bowl. The Denver Broncos, one of the most productive, prestigious teams in the NFL. There's only one other team that has went to eight Super Bowls, two other teams. I mean, it's, it's astronomical as to how they have been productive. But people don't get jealous of the Broncos because they've only won, what, uh, four Super Bowls. But with that in mind, the children of Israel are doing so good, they said, we don't like these people. Then they start coming up with stuff like, you must be a Jew because you're so stingy. Yeah. Or they'll come up with just acronyms that are bad about Jewish people. Jewish people, they live in a land called Israel. Israel is, is, is as big as Rhode Island. 
That's nothing. It's, it's like New Jersey. It's a tiny area in all of America. But Israel is the same. They're in the Middle East. And everybody there hates them. Masses of land. And they're huge. But they're disliked. Well, that's what's happened here. I want you to know that when you get prosperous, when you start doing good, people start disliking you. Happens in your job. You as a child of God. You as a child of God get uh, a kind of looked upon in a bad way. You can't talk a lot about Christianity on your job. They'll uh, uh, ostracize you. People just do not like Christians. Same way with you. Now, on the other hand, there's a lot of favor that the Jews have. There's a lot of favor that you have. Some of the most smartest human beings to ever exist on the planet, Jews. Albert Einstein was a Jew. Uh, uh, all of these guys, if you begin to look at them, they're Jewish people and they're very prosperous. Well, when we look at that, I want you to see that when you get trapped and you get into the bondage that the Jewish people got into and you get into a bad situation, that God begins to look for a hero. God in you is looking for a hero. He wants to look among his people. He wants to look throughout the earth, saved or unsaved, but God's looking for a hero, church. Do you know that? As God began to look for the hero to rescue the children of Israel, he finally found one. And heroes can be found in the most obscure places. Sometimes he can find a hero in the projects. He can find a hero in prison. He can find a hero among this church. But God is always looking for a hero. And when we look at that, I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. In your bulletin, it's on there. And it says this, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so, we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. God is looking for a hero, and he's going to test your heart. He tested the hearts of the children of Israel, but among them, he couldn't find a hero, church. So he went outside of that scene. Look what else the Word of God says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Now that's a powerful thought right there as we go a little further into that scripture, but look what it means. Be diligent. That means to stay on track. That means to stand as a soldier. That means not to give up. Because when you are solid and do not give up and drive forward as a hero, what God does is He sees your diligence and then He puts a stamp of approval upon you. Amen. He wants to put a stamp of approval on Nathan. That's right. He wants to put it on David. He wants to put it on Danette. He wants to put it on Art. God is looking for somebody that's diligent and he can put an approval stamp on you. Look what he says further in that scripture. A worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. You're the worker, church. You do not need to be ashamed. All you need to do is be truthful. Rightly dividing it. In other words, standing with those of truth, whether you're liked or not. A lot of times, 
you can get into a position where you're disliked because you speak truth. Have you ever said the truth and people are like, you could have lied, you could have fudged. Why'd you tell the truth? People get upset with you. Who cares God's approved you? Put the stamp on you. That's all that matters. This final scripture I want to uh, instill in your heart this morning is James 1.12. It says this, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Oh, church, give it over and give up and give it to God. Fight the temptation. Don't be overwhelmed with this tempting mindset that's in your heart and in your mind. How many of you have ever been tempted? Okay, I'm going to ask a question. I don't want your hands raised. How many of you have been tempted and failed the temptation? Put your hands down. Church, all of us have probably done that at one time or another. How many of you have looked and you shouldn't have? And your wife slapped you upside your head? Or how many of you have looked and shouldn't have and your husband speeds in the car? I used to do that to my wife before I got saved. Whenever I would get upset with her, she'd start telling me things that I didn't want to hear, I'd start speeding. Why? I don't know. Because I was evil. That's all. But I would speed in my car and she hated it. I guess that's why I did it. She'd get scared. She'd get upset. And so now today, she doesn't like driving with me. And I drive like a little old man. For her sake. But the point is, church, is that it says that blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has, approved, has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. Say, I want a crown of life. That's what God is going to give you, a crown of life. And he says, which the Lord has promised to those that love him so, Enduring temptation means you love God. When you endure it and you put up with it and don't give in to it and go forward and stand and do the right thing, you love God. That's why you do it. Because you love God. We need to battle, church, through every difficulty. So, what does that mean? We are inducted into an army. When you're a child of God, you're a part of God's army. Like it or not, you're a part of the army. You may be a, 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 a diligent private, you may be a lieutenant, a captain, a general, I don't know. But I do know that you're in his army. So I want you to look with me, and as God began to look for a hero, he found one finally in an obscure place in Exodus chapter 3. Turn there with me. And as we go to Exodus chapter 3, I want to show you in the first 10 verses some powerful action that took place. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. So now his, his dad, father-in-law, is a priest. He's a pastor. And he led the flock to the back of the desert, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now, Moses, he's a sheep herder, one of the lowest positions you could be. My families are shepherds, sheep herders. A lot of my family raise sheep, so I know a little bit about sheep. I used to have to go with them, and I, and I was with them when they would take them uh, to different places and pastures, and they had to push them into the corrals, and et cetera, and they'd separate them. So uh, they would do this, and they would have one part of the season they would bring them in 
And that would be during the springtime. And it says this. And as he was doing this, he said that he went to the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire and the bush was not consumed. This is heavy because they do say that there's a phenomenon that actually occurs. And what that is, is it's almost like a, an internal combustion. And in the deserts, sometimes bushes, because they have this uh, substance of creosalt. Creosalt is kind of like an oil. And there are sometimes in these areas where these bushes are, and because of the heat, the heat will come on the bush, cause it to burst into flames. But it gets consumed right away. It doesn't continue burning. The difference is that Moses was there with the sheep on the dark side of the mountain and this bush caught on fire and the bush was burning. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Okay, the phenomenon is that the bush burns up and it ends up going out. This is saying that there's a flame of fire on the bush, but the bush is not burning. So he sees this miraculous fire around this bush with this flame going on. Verse four, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses and he said here I am here you are you are in a situation where there is a bush in your life it's caught on fire God's trying to draw you to him you go to God and God sets you free but what God does is he says Tara Valentine Bobby whatever it may be but God has called you out of your dilemma. He's trying to get your attention and he's pointing you to his uh, victorious flame of fire that's going to burn all the sin out and off your life. So he does this and he says, Moses. And, he, and, and as he's called, verse 5 says, and he said, do not draw near this place. So the unusual thing is God calls him, but he says, don't come here. Now, that's, that's a little strange, but God gives him instruction. And what he's doing is he's instructing him, take all of your man-made situations, take all that you have brought into your life through mankind and you yourself, and take it off. Take away the man-made situation of your life. Then God will deal with you. Yes. In other words, get set free from your sin and God will deal with you. But he says this as he takes us through. And he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. From the place where you stand is holy ground. God's calling us to a holy ground, church. He's calling us to get right, get set, and get ready. Get right, get set, and get ready. God wants you to be ready for Him. So He does this, and He says, Moreover, He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely, surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. For I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, 
and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. So what God does is he not only pulls them out, but he gives him specific instructions. God is instructing you, church. He wants to give you specifics. God doesn't want to mince words. He wants you to know, quit sinning. Okay, I'll quit. He wants you to know, start praying. Okay, I'll pray. He'll speak to you about the specifics that are going to benefit you. God brings, when he comes into our lives, benefit. He brought benefit to Moses. But he says this, he says, look, he says, all these children of Israel, they're in Egypt. I don't know if you know that or not, Moses, but they are. Not only are they in Egypt, but I want you to take them to a place filled with milk and honey. And Moses is probably excited about that. That's great, God, that you're going to do that. Uh, call me when it's over. That's probably what he's saying. It's like us, church. God pulls you out of the dredges of, of messes, and he says, guess what? I want you to be a part of this kingdom. Okay, God, that's wonderful. Not only to be a part of the kingdom, but I also want you to do this. So he specifies to him, of all of these horrible people, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Hittites, etc. And he tells them, these people live where the land of milk and honey is. And I want you to take these 3.5 million people there. Can you imagine leading that many people into a place filled with milk and honey? Where do you begin? Moses probably isn't even thinking that far. He's just thinking, this is awesome, I'm talking to God. God's speaking, church, and he wants to speak to you. You just have to open your ears to hear him. Amen? Look what he says. He, after he tells him this, he says in verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now. Come on, Moses. Come now. He's talking to you, Linda. He's talking to you, Jesus. He's talking to you, Israel. He's talking to you, Angela. He's talking to each of us, Tracy. He is calling you out. He's talking to you. He's coming now. Come now. And when God does that, something supernatural happens in your life. And that's salvation. When salvation comes, you get free. And now you're on a whole new path of life. And God wants to use you. He has called you. He called Moses. But look what Moses does. Come now, therefore. I will send you. Wait a minute. I need someone to help in nursery. Come now. I will send you to help in nursery. Oh, wait a minute. I need Sunday school teacher. I will send you Sunday school teacher. Oh, wait a minute. That's not my calling. I'm called to be a prophet. I'm called to be an apostle. I'm called to be a mother, and I put up with kids all the time. I do not want to work with kids. We have all kinds of excuses, and you too, man. Amen. You don't get out of this. You can do couples in Sunday school and nursery. Right. Right. And the men say, well, I, I'm an usher. I'm a, I need to do this. I... No. When God calls us, God calls us. But what we do is, well, I'm not here consistently enough. Well, when you're here, we'll use you. <laughs> oh, great. Now I'm not going to come back. <laughs> so he says this to Moses. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But look what Moses says. This is a trip. 
You people are too much. He says in verse 11, But Moses said to God, Who am I? Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? I'm a nothing, God. I don't have an education. I don't have a GED. Who am I? God, I can't even speak good. He said, oh, you can't? No, I stuttered. Do you know Moses was a stutterer? You know what God did to him? He said, that's okay, Moses. I'll call your brother. He's coming right now. He's in the desert. I can see him. Moses is like, oh, man, I'm trapped. Now, but I don't want to go, God. He says, that's okay, Moses. I've called you. You're going to go. Like it or not. I have a task that I've set for you, Moses. He's got a task for each and every one of you. You just have to step into it. Okay, so Moses ends up in this predicament. And so he goes in and he gets instruction from God. God gives him a staff. He says, you see that staff you got, Moses? He said, that's a God staff now. I am making it supernatural and powerful. And he says, this is cool, God. He said, throw it on the ground. So he takes this staff. It's a rod probably about this tall because he uses it to climb up the mountains and to smack the sheep around. And, you know, and he's walking with it. A real cool staff. So he says, throw it on the ground. So Moses tosses it on the ground and it turns into a snake. Oi, mama! <laughs> Moses runs and hides. Coco man! Whatever he said. I don't know what Jews do when they get scared. But he got scared. This rod turns into a snake. Then God says, I want you to pick up the rod. He reaches down. He says, are you sure, God? And he reaches down. When he touches it, it turns back into a rod. Then God says, another thing I'm going to do, Moses, is put your hand in your coat. Puts his hand in his coat. He says, now pull it out. Oh, my God, I've got leprosy. His hand turned into leprosy. And he said, put it back in. And he does. And he brings it out and he's clean again. What God is simply saying to you and what he was saying to Moses, I'm a God. I am the God. I am more than able to fix you. I'm more than able to use you. I'm more than able to do what it is you're going through. The hell you're facing, I can get you out of it. The difficulty in your mind, I can clear your mind. The sleeplessness at night, I can put you to sleep. I can do anything. I am God. That's what he's telling Moses. So in all of this church, as he lays this whole thing out to Moses and gives him these declarations, he then takes him through a path when he goes to Pharaoh and he tells Pharaoh, he said, Pharaoh, I want you to let God's people go. Pharaoh looks at him and he says, who are you? He says, I'm Moses. He said, I can care less, Moses. He said, why should I let the people go? He said, because the Lord God Almighty said to let it go. So as he goes before him, he throws his rod down. The rod then turns into a snake. So the magicians come. The devil always wants to make you think that you're in such a trap that you can't get out of it, but you are confessing the word of God to the devil, and the devil laughs at you. And so what did he do? The magicians brought two rods in, threw them down, they both turned into snakes. And Moses is like, oh great, the devil has the same trick. So what does God do? God makes Moses' a snake eat up both of those monkey snakes. Takes care of the problem. Picks the rod back up. And the Pharaoh says, hey, I don't care. I'm not going to let your people go. So Moses leaves. As we see this, he, uh, Pharaoh gets mad. He says, okay, because you did this to me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make the children make bricks without straw. They have to get their own straw. 
So the children of Israel are, are upset and they have to go find straw to make brick because you can't make brick that's going to be worth anything without straw there. So they do this and the people get ticked off at Moses. So the next scene, he comes in, that was in Exodus 5. In Exodus 6, he begins to talk about this rod. He shows the rod. In Exodus 7, he tells him, he says, you tell him, I am the Almighty God. And I'm going to turn the rivers into blood. And he laughs at him. Pharaoh does. He says, go for it, dude. And so what uh, he does is he has Aaron put his rod off over the river and it all turns to blood. So as it turns to blood, everything turns to blood. They freak out and he says, okay, I'll let the people go. So just like the devil church, people will promise things and they will not be true to the promise. But sometimes your boss, your loved ones, your situation could very well be happening the way God did to Pharaoh. You know what the Bible says? Instead of God uh, making Pharaoh and letting Pharaoh soften up, he hardens Pharaoh's heart. Why? Why would God harden the heart of our enemy? God, shouldn't you soften it so they could give us favor? You know why, church? Because you've not learned yet. You're saying, man, this is the second time I've been through this. How many of you have been through something five times? <laughs> Everybody should raise their hand. It's like, man, I shouldn't have went for that. Or how about to some of you ladies? You got a guy that comes up to you and say, oh, mon ami. Oh, your lips are like pomegranates. Your eyes are like the doves of the earth. Oh, your hair flows like milk and honey. Really? And you're in your robe. I'm telling you, church, you'll have that happen. Another guy will come along. He'll say something else to you ladies, and you're for the okey-doke again. You melt. Another guy will come along, and before you know it, time and time again, you don't learn. And all God simply is saying is, I'm letting the okey-doke happen because you haven't learned. And you will not learn if I move them out of the way the first time. So this goes on. And then what happens is Pharaoh tells him he'll let him go, but then he doesn't. And God says, okay, you know what I'm going to do, Pharaoh? I'm going to bring frogs into the land of Egypt like you've never seen before. Frogs are coming out of everything. Frogs are coming out of their dishes. Frogs are coming out of their cupboards. Everywhere you see frogs, church, and this is God. Sometimes, because of your situation, you've got a frog in your life. Something that keeps jumping back into you. Something that keeps tempting you. That's that frog. That's the devil himself putting back into your mind the fact that if you steal this, you will not get caught. If you do this, you will not get caught. Go for it. Or... I would do it if I was you. You go for it, and all it is, church, is a frog of the enemy that keeps coming back. So God comes in, Moses gets rid of the frogs, Pharaoh refuses again to let him go. This goes on and on and on. The next thing that comes is lice. Can you imagine, church, having lice everywhere? Lice in your hair, lice in your head, lice in your rice. Whatever you see, lice everywhere. This is what happened to the children of Israel, and to the, uh, Pharaoh rather, and the children of Egypt. God brought lice and this became maddening. So the next thing that happens, he decides 
that he's going to let flies come. Flies everywhere. He gets rid of the lice and he lets the flies come in. Have you ever been anywhere where there's flies everywhere? And it's like, man, get, a, get away. They're buzzing on you. They're, they're trying to get on your food. Get away from the food. Cover it. Cover it. Or whatever it may be. This was in an astronomical way. Flies in such a degree that people could not stand it. And they begged Pharaoh to let the people go. So Pharaoh told them, okay, I'll do it. Didn't do it. Then God says, okay, at command of the Lord, I'm going to kill all the livestock. Kills all of the livestock except for the livestock in the land of Goshen where the Jewish people are. The next thing that happens, he ends up bringing boils upon the Egyptians. Boils on everybody. Men, women, children, Pharaoh, you name it, except the children of Israel. <coughs> he does the same thing. He doesn't let them go. And then he finally, God says, okay, we're getting near the end here. I'm hardening Pharaoh's heart for reasons. Because I want the world to look back on this period of time to see that I am Almighty God and I can do anything. And I want the people to be encouraged that I will fix it eventually. But you must be patient, hold on, and do what I've called you to do. He gets rid of the boils again. And when this next catastrophe comes, it's hail. They said that the hail was huge, the size of rocks. And not only was it huge, but it was mingled with fire. Hail and fire, fire burning everywhere. Hail everywhere. And it was just attacking the Egyptians. And finally, Pharaoh said, all right, I'm let him go. He does it. So the final problem is that God says, okay, now I'm going to bring locusts. And I don't know if you've ever experienced locusts before, but locusts eat everything up. They tear it all up. There is nothing left over that the locust kills and destroys. Pharaoh gives up, gives in, and the final nail on the coffin is Pharaoh begins to come against Moses, and he says that I'm going to kill all of the firstborn of the children of Israel. And Moses said, out of your mouth shall come the final judgment. And Pharaoh loses his own child because he dared to fight against God. Church, I'm telling you, God will fix it. You have to hold on. He lets the people go. They begin to exodus out of Egypt to the land of Israel, Palestine. That's where they're headed. But what I want you to see is that God's promises are yes and amen. God promising things to you. God's going to set you free. God's going to change your circumstances.